Welcome to worship this Transfiguration Sunday. I'm Pastor Ann and my husband, Pastor Gray, and I are both so excited that you are here to worship with us whenever and wherever you are. This is a special Sunday. We have a special um, guest preacher, the Reverend Dr. Brian Blunt. He is the president of Union Presbyterian Seminary, where Gray and I both attended seminary. He is transcending time and space to bring us a transfiguration sermon today. The seminary choir will also be providing an anthem for us, um, and their director, Doug Brown, has a congregational hymn in four-part harmony for us. So we're excited to be able to utilize these resources from the seminary um, for our worship service today. We know that many of you have heard the news that our session has made the decision to move from two music programs with two music directors to one music ministry with one music director. This was a difficult decision given the love and respect that we have for both of our current music directors, and yet it was a decision we felt was necessary as we move forward in our ministry. Ann Fisher and Kristen Hurd, the chairs of our worship committee, are hard at work putting together opportunities for us to say goodbye and to thank Tom Haynes and Bill Seal for their excellent ministry in our midst. We will be getting you more information about that as soon as those plans are finalized. So please stay tuned, check your e-news. We'll try to get information out in as many ways as we can. Pastor Gray and I are here for pastoral support. If any of you would like to have an individual conversation, and I know that our session members would also welcome conversation with you if you would like to talk to one of them. Um, we also would invite you to come to our annual meeting next week when we'll be talking about some of our future ministry plans um, and to be able to explain a little bit more about where we're going, including the opportunity for us to start gathering in person again as early as March. So we've got a lot of important information to share with you at the annual meeting. We do hope you'll come next Sunday right after our 10 a.m. online worship. It'll be at 1045. The Zoom link will be coming out. We'll give plenty of instructions for how you can join us on Zoom for our annual meeting. Today, after worship, we will have Zoom fellowship at 1045, so we hope that you will switch over from YouTube or Facebook, wherever you are connecting with worship, um, and join in our Zoom fellowship. For those of you who would like to talk more about transfiguration, Rob Keeler will be leading adult discipleship on that same Zoom link at 1115. Pastor Gray will also be leading a Presbyterian 101 class. It is for new members, but it's also for anybody who has interest in learning a little bit more about Presbyterians and about PCW. This week, um, the topic is going to be the history of this particular church and more information about how you can get involved with all of the incredible ministry that is happening here. We um, will also today, it's a busy day, we will be having an opportunity for you to pick up your Lent materials. So we have a really cool devotional. Um, it will turn into a paper chain that um, you will put together and then you will take apart. Um, we will unbreak the chain as we get into Lent. Every day there's a little prayer, a scripture, a brief meditation, and so it will help us have a visual reminder that we are closer and closer to celebrating that resurrection glory of Jesus Christ. So you'll pick up a packet of these. We have some ashes for you to take home with you so that you can participate in our Zoom Ash Wednesday service this week. It's hard to believe Lent is starting this Wednesday, Ash Wednesday. We also have some of our One Great Hour of Sharing materials so that you can participate in supporting One Great Hour of Sharing. And for any of you who would prefer to have a hard copy of the annual report, we have these ready to distribute as well. So those should have come in your email, um, but I, we know that some of you just really like to have a hard copy to look at, um, to, you know, take with you while you're waiting someplace or those kinds of things. Um, read over coffee in the morning in your chair by the hopefully... Um, warm heater. So um, if you would like a hard copy, you can pick those up today. We're also printing some more directories. Um, we updated directories last fall. If you haven't picked one of those up, those are available as well. 
Today, our blood drive is happening. I actually just gave blood right before I came up here. Um, it's a packed house with, with appropriate social distancing, um, but lots of folks have come out to give that gift of life, and so we are so thankful that we can support this incredible mission. Um, um, a lot of you have signed up, so some of you are still going to be coming yet today. Um, if you're here to, to donate blood, you can go ahead and pick up your Lenten materials, um, but if you're not donating blood, then Pastor Gray and I will be handing things out between noon and one. Finally, Ash Wednesday, as I said, it is here, February 17th, which is this Wednesday, 7 p.m. on Zoom. We'll be sending out that link. Um, you won't have to trudge through the snow. You can be safely at home, and we will mark the beginning of Lent um, as a holy and set-apart time for us to dig deeper in our faith. Now, let us turn our hearts and minds to worship with our prelude. Please join us in the call to worship. God of our mountaintops, give us gravity. God of our valleys, give us perspective. God of our peaks, give us stillness. God of our depths, give us footsteps forward. God of the whole creation, give us your voice. God of our inmost quiet souls, Give us your voice. God of our bodies. <laughs> Give us your spirit. God with us in our restlessness and our wakefulness. Give us your rest. God with us in our sleep and our calm. Give us vision of newness. Let us worship God. Amen. We'd now like to invite Adam Haywood, uh, Hayden. I don't know why. <laughs> Give him blood right before worship. I'll do better next year. We'd like to invite Adam Hayden to have our children's message and also our time for confession. Cool. Thanks, Pastor Ann, Pastor Gray. Appreciate it. Uh, my name is Adam. I'm the youth program director here at PCW. Want to invite all the young people, all the kids, gather around the screen. So you might have heard of this thing that we do at church called a confession or a prayer of confession. And you might be thinking, well, what is a confession? What, why do we do that? What is it? I like to think about it uh, with a big bag of rocks, like just huge rocks that are so heavy, and we have them in this bag, and then we put them on our backs, and we try to take off running, but we can't because the rocks are just so, so heavy. And to me, what prayer confession does, it just lets go of those rocks, and those rocks just disappear. And those rocks are our sins, the things that we do that are not right, the bad things that we know we should not do, the things that we should do, but we don't do, all that bad stuff that we do, we just let go of it. We say, God, please forgive us. We're sorry for messing up again. And God's forgiveness is with us all the time. And as soon as we ask for that forgiveness, it's like those rocks just disappear and we can run fast again and live free again. So that's kind of how I like to think of the prayer of confession. And it's important that we do it so that we can run and we can go tell the world about God and about God's love and we can love freely. So if you would... Pray with me this prayer of confession. I'll do it very slowly, and you can repeat after me, and we can do it together. All right? All right, let's do it. Dear God, 
we are sorry for the things we know we should not do and for the things we should do but we don't do. Please forgive us. Thank you for your forgiveness. Help us open our arms and catch that forgiveness so we can run. Amen. Scripture tells us as far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our sins from us. Friends, know that you are forgiven and be at peace. I now invite you to pray with me as we pray for God's illumination. Holy and loving God, there are so many voices swirling around us and within us. And so we pray that you would silence in us any voice but your own, so that as your word is read, as your word is proclaimed, we would hear your word for us today. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. Let us listen to what the Spirit is saying to the church. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one was with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of God. For the people of God, thanks be to God. And now we'll have a sermon from the Reverend Dr. Brian. Good morning, everyone. I bring you greetings from Union Presbyterian Seminary with campuses in Richmond, Virginia and Charlotte, North Carolina. Should you find yourself in either of those cities, I hope that you will take opportunity to come by and know our hospitality. We would love to welcome you. And now, let us worship God. The first time I saw the movie Glory, I was so overwhelmed that at the end of it, I couldn't get out of my seat. I just sat there. I wasn't alone. There was a lady behind me. She just kept saying, wow. Slowly, maybe four times. It was dark in the theater still. They hadn't turned the lights up because the credits were playing on the screen and this haunting music was reverberating through the speakers. And people weren't moving. They were just sitting there. Not the way they do at the end of movies today when they are expecting some bonus movie footage. There was nothing coming after the credits. There was nothing left but the scrolling of endless names that were too small and rolling by too fast to read. And that music. 
and the darkened figures of those people who just kept sitting and staring at the screen and the hush of that woman's wow behind me. This movie about enslaved men who had no future except the future allowed them by the men and women who owned them. Cancel them, cancel their hopes, cancel their dreams, cancel their history, cancel their birthrights, cancel their names, cancel their families, cancel their freedom, canceled many of their very lives. The 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry, the United States' first all-American, African-American regiment. The movie was about them. The images were striking. The training of the black soldiers who had to fight for uniforms and equal pay. The whipping of a black soldier who had to run off the camp to find decent shoes. The despair of the regiment when at first all they were allowed to do was manual labor. The disciplined fury of the men when they saw their first action. The heroism and professionalism of the soldiers as they waged this uniquely American war. The suicidal final charge against Fort Wagner on the beach near Charleston, South Carolina, where 281 of the 600 soldiers in the 54th lost their lives. The movie ends with this defeat and the deafening quiet that followed it. The way the Gospel of Mark ends with a crucifixion and the emptiness of a vacant tomb. Movies and Gospels are supposed to end with the good guys winning. But, wow, this devastating defeat. Like that vicious crucifixion. Where was the glory in it? The glory was in the desperation to overcome. The glory was in the resistance, the struggle to prove oneself worthy of being free and equal and being able to fight for that freedom and equality with dignity and honor. The glory of standing resolute before men and women who seek to cancel your very identity and place in this world and demand that they look you in the eye and acknowledge your worth, say your name, respect your life. Those men, those once enslaved African-American men, they faced what they faced with determination and faith in God and faith in themselves. They were not just fighting for them, they were fighting for everyone like them. They were fighting for me. More than a century before I would be born and already they were fighting and dying for me. Fighting for African-American voting rights. Fighting against income disparity, disparity in access to education, the matter of African-American lives not mattering as much as the lives of others in moments of crisis and conflict. That is glory and I thought still sitting in that darkened movie theater still. Wow. I suspect that word, wow, and the feeling behind it rather nicely sums up what Peter, James, and John were feeling up on that mountaintop with a transfigured Jesus, a man who had just finished telling them that he was about to lose everything so that they would be able to win. I suspect that this is why Jesus took them up there to transfigure their vision away from the cross he had just predicted in chapter 8, the cross of death, to the glory of resurrection. So they would stop fretting over the difficulties and dangers dogging Jesus' ministry and focus on the glory of that ministry instead. There are two other times in Mark's gospel when it's just Peter, James, and John, and Jesus. 
At 537, when Jesus goes to see Jairus' daughter, the little 12-year-old girl whose life had been abruptly and tragically ended, canceled, you might say. These three are the only ones in his discipleship core that Jesus allows to go to Jairus' home to be with him when he greets her family and friends. Her corpse is lying in her bedroom. When Jesus tells the people to stop mourning, they laugh at him. So Jesus puts everyone out except the little girl's parents and Peter, James, and John. And Jesus goes into her, and what he does in the deafening silence of that lifeless room is miraculous. He resurrects her in front of her mom and dad and Peter, James, and John. Jesus wanted them to see the glory of resurrection, the dawn of this little girl's new life in the midst of a community of people who had given up on her old life, dead to life. Wow, Jesus. Wow. There's one other time. At 1433 in Gethsemane, before his arrest, when everything is falling apart, death is looming, and in a future cross moment, death will win. Death will take Jesus. But before that happens, in this Gethsemane moment, Jesus wants Peter, James, and John with him. Why? So they can see. Jesus is the key to new life. In him, what is dead, even a 12-year-old girl, even his own very crucified existence can and will live again. But right now, while Jesus walks and talks, lives and breathes, yes, in Gethsemane, they find out that promise of resurrecting life is a threat. Whenever someone like those black men of the 54th Massachusetts fights to give new life to people whose old lives are crushed by state-sanctioned and publicly permitted death, people in power use their power to enslave, hunt, lynch, profile, segregate, incarcerate, denigrate, and maim the lives of those life-giving people. Jesus was the ultimate life-giving person. And in Gethsemane, the people in power who had prof profiled Jesus all across Palestine were now hunting him on the outskirts of Jerusalem with the expectation of segregating him and his seditious, troublemaking followers from the law-abiding believers and then incarcerating them behind the bars of tradition, denigrating them with the scandal of blasphemy and murdering him under the banner of righteousness. Jesus wanted Peter, James, and John to see all this unfolding. See how he was betrayed to this destruction by one of his own. See how he prayed to stay connected to God even in the midst of that betrayal. How could Jesus still believe in God's love and protection in the midst of all of this? How could they believe in the promise of Jesus' new life if the people in power in this old life were able to wield such devastation and death against him? How? Because of this time, because of this mountaintop time, here on the mountain, something very special happened. In the midst of this current trouble life, Peter, James, and John were given a glimpse of the coming glorious life. The promise of resurrection blew open right in front of their eyes. While dwelling on the dirt of the present, they were elevated into the ether of eternity. So they could see past the trees, see above the clouds, see beyond the haters, see around the fears, see through the threats, even through the titanic threat of death itself, and believe in life. From this mountaintop vantage point, they ought to be able to see what really happened in that dead girl's bedroom. From this mountaintop vantage point, they ought to be able to see what will really happen in and after Gethsemane. This moment on this mountain is a glorious promise that no matter how bad it seems, it will turn out all right. Bad as a dead 12-year-old little girl. Bad as a betrayed, soon-to-be-crucified teacher, it will 
turn out all right. <laughs> that seems a banal, inane, cliched, simplistic theology for someone who has a Ph.D. in New Testament studies. You think I could come up with something better than that? It will turn out all right. That's what someone says when he doesn't know what else to say. And I must admit, there are times I simply just don't know what else to say. I have seen good people get these god-awful diseases, and even after fighting valiantly with great faithfulness, they still wither away and die. I have seen good men and women stand for something they believe in, fighting passionately to make a better church or a better school or a better society for themselves, their children, and their community, only to be met with derision and ridicule and scorn. And in some countries, even in our own, many of them end up losing their lives. Here in the middle of this Black History Month, I think of the many civil rights leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. who lost their lives fighting for the lives of others, like Medgar Evers killed in Jackson, Mississippi, fighting for the freedom of his people, like those four little black girls bombed in that black Baptist church whose congregation was demanding equality for all God's children in Birmingham, Alabama in 1963, just fighting to grow old and grow up. Addie Mae Collins, Cynthia Wesley, Carol Robertson, and Carol Denise McNair say their names. Addie Mae, Cynthia, and Carol would be 72 today. Carol Denise would be 68 if they had lived if everything had turned out all right. But you see, Jesus didn't just go up on that mountain to show something to Peter, James, and John. He went up there for Arthur, who lost his battle to cancer. He went up there for Martin Luther King Jr., who lost his life to a bullet. He went up there for Mega Evers, who lost his life to hate. He went up there for Addie Mae and Cynthia and Carol and Carol Denise, who lost their lives because the parents of little white children did not speak out loudly enough and stand up visibly enough for little black children. He went up there for any person, any people, struggling to overcome a pandemic of virus, a pandemic of racial oppression, a pandemic of societal upheaval, a pandemic of political divisiveness. Jesus went up that mountain so that Peter, James, and John would know that no matter how bleak this life gets, even unto the darkness of death, there will come a transfiguration of light. Life lived in God can and will light up. A little girl lying dead in a bedroom is not the end. Gethsemane and the crucifixion that comes after Gethsemane is not the end. Almost a half million people dead in this country from a virus is not the end. Racial enslavement, racial segregation, and continuing racial injustice is not the end. Political divisiveness that leads to riotous insurrection is not the end. The end is the glory that Jesus unleashed up there on that mountaintop. The kind of glory we are called to unleash down here in the valleys of our lives. Up there on the mountain stands Moses who, in, who, who set God's enslaved people free. Down here in the valley huddle masses of people still caught up in chains of racial and spiritual and gender and geographical oppression. Up there on the mountain moves Elijah, who faced down a prophetic horde of opposition to the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and would not be moved. Down here in the valley tremble people overwhelmed by poverty, hunger, inadequate access to health care, and unequal educational opportunity. Up there on the mountain walks Jesus, who would touch lepers, who would eat with tax collectors and sinners, who would break the laws that prevented people from being right with each other and right with God, who would condemn the unrighteousness of those who proclaim themselves to be religiously right. Down here in the valley, people kneel for change and pray for transformation. 
up there. Up there, the glory of life rises like the smoke from the fires of death. We are so continuously and contemptuously igniting down here. Up there. Up there. Jesus was transfigured with the otherworldly glory of God right before their eyes. And all of a sudden, everything in this rusty, beaten down old world just dazzles. Peter is so flabbergasted, so discombobulated, so dazzled that he completely mismanages the moment. Representing James and John, he says, well, Rabbi, I can see now why you brought us up here. The next words out of Peter's mouth confirm that he doesn't have a clue as to why Jesus brought them up there. Rabbi, he says, let us build three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Building tents takes time. Staying in tents up on a mountaintop retreat takes people out of time. Peter thinks the appropriate thing to do now is to build a little retreat center. And why not? Look at the glory all around him on that mountaintop. It's not just the light show. It's the people the light shows up. Moses, Elijah, Jesus is their own little discipleship Mount Rushmore. Live, up close and personal. Build tents for them. Caucus with them. Have a Bible study with them. Worship with them. Do everything in your power to stay with them. These people represent the greatness of their faith. Hold on to that greatness. Tabernacle with that greatness. Escape with that greatness. Don't look forward, Jesus. Forward is Gethsemane and Golgotha, a vacant tomb and an empty, broken discipleship core. Look to the past, to the glory days we remember with Moses and Elijah. Here there is life in the midst of all the difficulties swirling down there in the valley, difficulties that will drown us if we wade back into their stiff and unpredictable currents. There is nothing but the specter of failure and desperation and death. Let us make it so you can stay up on the mountaintop and retreat, Jesus. Stay with Moses. Stay with Elijah. And let us tent up with the three of you. Jesus doesn't answer. God answers for him. God answers from the heavens. God tells them, who do you think this is? Peter, James, and John, this is my son. My son. He represents me, who I am, how I think, what I want for my people. Listen to him. For God's sake, Peter, James, and John, for my holy sake, stop listening to the little fearful voice inside your head. Stop listening to the counsel of people who keep telling you to keep a low profile. Don't stir up trouble. Stop listening to the voices that tell you to revel and recline in past greatness. Use the memory of your glorious past as the energy to fuel a determined fight for the glory of God in your present and your future. How do you do that? Not by hiding in tents up here on the mountain, but by listening to him. Listening to my son. Listen to his words. Listen to his life. And the first thing you hear is, you need to get down off this mountain. Look, parents often overlook the faults of their children. God, I think, was overlooking a lot of the problems surrounding the kind of person God's son had become. Up here on the mountain, they can keep him out of trouble. Keep him tethered to the memories of Moses and Elijah. Stop him from trying to make horrible, troublesome memories of his own. Up here on the mountain, he shines like the sun. Down there in the valley, he filthies himself by cavorting with filthy people. Down there, he's touching lepers. Down there, he's partying with criminals and sex workers. Down there, he's breaking sacred laws. Down there, he's reviling the people who are religiously righteous. And the worst thing... This man who dazzles up here is constantly soiling his reputation and his person down there by going over into Gentile territories and preaching and acting like Gentiles. Gentiles are also a part of God's coming rule. Gentiles, for God's sake, God. How can a man who relates to the wrong race of people dazzle for God? And how can we dazzle for God if we're following him? 
No, he's too inclusive of the wrong kinds of people. He's too dismissive of the orderliness imposed by the law. He's too determined to bring about a future, a vision of the future and the present that is in direct opposition to the kind of present the people in power have produced. And if he goes back down there, we won't be able to stop him. So God, let us build him a sanctuary of tents up here where he can dazzle and people can look up at the mountain and see the dazzle on the mountaintop and just be amazed. Everybody can stay clean that way. We could stay with him. Maybe you could even get us some of those dazzling outfits. Stay up here with the past. Stay up here with your son. And stay out of trouble. They weren't intending tents for Jesus, Peter, James, and John. They were intending sanctified, secluded sanctuaries for themselves. I wonder sometimes if that isn't what we have done with our churches. We say they are for Jesus, but we really build them for us. Sanctuaries that too often become just that, sanctuaries. Sanctuaries that save us from too closely following Jesus. Sanctuaries where we can spend a lot of time meditating on the past. People like Moses and Elijah and Peter, James and John. But not enough time following a risen Christ who is on the revolutionary move, engaging and inclusive, rule breaking, wrong people embracing ministry that gets people, gets his own people in trouble. What was Peter thinking? Stay up on the mountain. Stay out of trouble. What Christians are too often thinking today. Stay in church. And stay out of trouble. Here on the mountain, God speaks out of a cloud. In Exodus 24, 16, God spoke to Moses out of a cloud. Mark says this transfiguration story happens after six days when Moses was up on Mount Sinai. The glory of God covered him in the mountain for, you got it, six days. Jesus takes three companions. Yes, Moses took three companions. Jesus' countenance is transformed. Yep, Moses' countenance was transformed. Peter, James, and John are afraid. When the people saw the glory on Moses' face, they were afraid. This Jesus story is a recasting of that Exodus story. And what was that Exodus story about? It was about the struggle, the glorious struggle, to liberate God's people from oppression. It was about the revolutionary idea that God would not allow God's people to struggle forever, that God would send someone to intervene, that in the midst of dying and death, God would foment life. Revolutionary, emancipatory, dazzling life. God sent Moses, God sent Jesus, just as Jesus intends one day to send Peter, James, John, and us. Down from the mountaintop into the valley of the shadows of death with the blinding light of life. But before you go, you need to know something. If you do this, if you pack up your tents and wander out of your sanctuaries to go representing Jesus' liberating power in this oppressive world, you will find trouble. God says so. Remember the leper touching and the sin forgiving and the tax collector and center, sinner interacting and the unethical law breaking and the Gentile including. That's trouble right there. That trouble will bring Jesus betrayal. That trouble will bring Jesus suffering. That trouble will bring Jesus a cross. But none of that betrayal, suffering, cross can diminish the glorious light of life that shall endure. The light up on that mountain is a promise. The darkness will rage, but it will not win. The end is glory, and it is all the more glorious because of the struggle. Climb the mountain. There is glory up there. Climb down from the mountain because there are desperate people in terrible need down here. But there can be glory down here, too, if we listen to God's Son, if we follow God's Son out of the sanctuaries and into the valleys to transfigure like Jesus. Jesus' greatest transformation wasn't what happened up there on that divine mountain. His greatest transformation 
was what he did down here in our very human valleys. By speaking like Jesus, by living like Jesus, we can be caught up and transfigured by God so that we too might go into the valleys and transfigure our world. And wouldn't that be glorious? Amen. Sorry about that. We will make sure that the entire sermon is posted on Facebook, follow, Facebook and YouTube following this service. Um, we had some technical difficulties. Let us now uh, give thanks to you all for all the ways you have continued to support the work of PCW. We know that God is the giver of life and gives us so many incredible gifts and resources um, and so many of you have been so committed to this church, to the work that we do here, to the ministry that we do here, to the way that we are sharing God's good news, that you have dedicated a portion uh, of your resources to support this work here. So thank you, number one. Thank you for all that you do. It makes all the difference. Uh, it shows that you are invested uh, here and it really is uh, an incredible boost to Ann and I and the staff uh, that you support us that way. So now I want to say thank you. I want to offer that if you continue to continue to support the work we do, there are a couple ways that you can do it. One, you can go to our website at pcwyoming.org, uh, and there's a Give Online button in the right-hand corner, uh, and you can give that way, follow the prompts. You can also continue to send your checks to the church at 225 Wyoming Avenue, Cincinnati, Ohio, 45215. Uh, we give thanks to God for these gifts, uh, and we ask blessings upon those gifts that they may be a sign of our commitment to serve God in all that we do. So thank you for that. We will now hear our anthem from the seminary choir led by Doug Brown, who is the Director of Music and Adjunct Instructor in, in Church Music at the Seminary Union Presbyterian Seminary. Let's give a listen to that anthem. Oh.
Let us go to the Lord in prayer. O Lord, our God, Christ has been transfigured before us on a mountaintop. You have revealed your way to us in Christ. The way of the cross and resurrection calls us to be agitators of nonviolence in our world and all that we do and say. Indeed, in the power of Christ, you have enabled us to be your peace in our world. In Jesus' crucifixion, the violence of our world has been revealed as contrary to your way of peace. Transfigure us by your Spirit. Shape us as we move by your love and justice to be disciples in this weary and broken world. In your Spirit, O God, form us in the liberating power displayed in Moses and the prophetic witness of Elijah, and in the body of Christ who was raised from the dead to bring newness of life in the church and the world. Let our lives shine like the transfigured Christ so that we may be a blessing to those that struggle, a hope to the dying, and a sign of your new creation. As we continue to struggle with this pandemic, and social ills it has exposed, we pray that you would bestow courage to healthcare workers and those facilitating vaccinations. We ask a special, special measure of wisdom for the leadership of our country after yet another impeachment trial that we may seek to have accountability and grace and love in our governing we also pray that they may discern the path to bring aid to the afflicted of this pandemic. Lord, we, may we be agents of your love for those within our churches and in our communities. Today, especially, we want to pray for Patsy Gaines as she continues to recover in the hospital. Also, continue prayers for Margaret Orndorff as she is in rehab. We also ask prayers for our church, PCW, during a time of transition for our music program, that we may show appreciation for the gifts that Bill and Tom have given to us. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We will now hear our closing hymn, My Eyes Have Seen the Glory, sung by Doug Brown. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling up the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. God's truth is marching on. Glory. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. God's truth is marching on. God has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. And is sifting out all human hearts before the judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer. Oh, be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Hallelujah, God's truth is mine. 
marching on. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea. With a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make us holy, let us live to make all free. While God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. this charge and benediction. Hear the voice from the clouds saying to each and to all, you are my beloved. So beloved of God, listen to Christ. Follow in the way of Christ. Resist evil. Love one another as God and Christ has loved you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.